Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, editor in chief of Supply Chain Brain, and I want to welcome you to this webinar presentation on drones in the warehouse, the competitive mandate for rapid adoption presented by Verity. One quick note, there will be an audience question and answer session at the end of this presentation. Audience members are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Now, the use of drones for inventory control presents extraordinary benefits, but barriers to adoption persist, including the fear of investing in bleeding edge technology with no guarantee of achieving real results. Recently, however, Inventory drones have leapt into the mainstream thanks to advanced technologies that eliminate risk, increase ROI, and deliver the advantages of more frequent and more accurate inventory counts. So today, we're going to spotlight the state of inventory drones, speak with a global retail client who will share lessons learned from the project that was the catalyst for a growing global rollout. With that, I want to introduce our speakers for today. Professor Raffaello D'Andrea is founder and CEO of Verity. One of the world's foremost leaders in robotics and machine learning, he is a professor of dynamic systems and control at ETH Zurich, which is known as the MIT of Europe, a successful entrepreneur and supply chain thought leader. In 2003, he co-founded Kiva Systems, now Amazon Robotics, and co-created the Kiva system, a mobile robotic material handling and order fulfillment solution that dramatically advanced warehouse order fulfillment for e-commerce. In 2014, RAF founded Verity to deliver, to deliver the world's first fully autonomous inventory tracking system powered by self-flying drones. Omar Esviri is fulfillment unit operations leader with IKEA Switzerland. He has more than 14 years of experience in senior management functions at IKEA Germany, IKEA Australia, and IKEA Switzerland across the functions of finance, retail, and supply chain. As a logistics expert, he focuses on optimizing the omnichannel network to enable convenient and sustainable supply. Dr. Erez Agmoni is Senior Vice President of Innovation and Strategic Growth for Supply Chain Warehousing and Distribution North America with Maersk. His industry experience includes more than 25 years in supply chain management, freight forwarding, logistics, engineering, and digital innovation. Let me start with Omar uh, of IKEA. Let me take you back to the beginning of this story and ask you, what were the inventory problems that you were facing that necessitated change? Yes, hi. First of all, a uh, big thank you uh, for having uh, invited me. It's a pleasure to share uh, with you the, the, the experiences uh, that we have made. So uh, I would not say uh, that the inventory differences uh, were for us the starting point. So it was more the fact uh, that we were moving uh, from a, let's say, classical cash and carry retailer, meaning that the, the customers are coming physically uh, to our shop to an omnichannel retailer. Uh, which uh, means we have both uh, on and offline uh, business. And this simply requires another attention uh, on our inventory accuracy in all uh, our units. So, and then of course, there are two options uh, to overcome the challenge. First, to invest, uh, like Raf was sharing, in more people uh, and hours, or to, to be capable to do the counting manually or to invest uh, in new technologies. Okay. So once you did implement the technology, how quickly did you see an impact on warehouse operations? Uh, what we have learned there uh, is that uh, on the one hand, uh, the drones do enable a very proper and super reliable counting. Uh, so that gives us the base about how good or bad uh, we have worked throughout the day, uh, the week, but that we need at the same time proper ways of working in place to correct uh, and follow up accordingly. So this to secure a sustainable improvement uh, of our everyday uh, working processes, as well, uh, of course, uh, talks with our coworkers, uh, etc. So I would say uh, pilot store, uh, or the, let's say the very first unit uh, that we have uh, implemented took about three months to get the full uh, benefit uh, of it. What about the switchover? Were any challenges involved in that and going from, uh, you know, less automated to such a sophisticated system in, in a very short time? 
Well, well sorry, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't got the, the question. I'm just probably. wondering about how, how you made the transition. Were there any challenges associated with making the transition to this technology? I mean, you have an operation that you can't stop this, you know, the operate warehouse no. operation to put in the technology. So how no, do you no. do that and kind of keep the, keep the motor running at the same time you're putting in this innovative stuff? Yeah, I think the 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 the, the drones as such. Uh, so so the implementation uh, of the system is quite easy, and then uh, it's uh, like always uh, people uh, which are key. Uh, so mm -hmm. to really make sure that they are properly educated uh, and and knows uh, how how to work with them. But uh, the system as such and the drones uh, that uh, that went super easy and uh, and uh, and yeah. Okay. So, what, what? Tell me more about exactly what was the impact of the implementation? What difference did it make, and, and what were the benefits you saw? Yeah, I think one of uh, one of the major benefits, uh, of course, uh, is uh, since uh, we have uh, installed the Verity system, uh, that we do scan much more. So, so we have uh, much more inventory scanning uh, that takes place compared to before. So, we have today uh, around about nineteen. So, one nine. Uh, more scannings uh, compared uh, to before. So we have moved from checking around about 30% uh, of the 150,000 uh, pellets we have uh, in movements in a store per year to over 90%. Uh, and that leads for us uh, to some great outcomes. First of all, uh, in uh, better productivity. Uh, so we, we need, of course, to invest less time. So when we are talking unproductive hours, uh, we can use uh, these hours uh, much, much better. And let's say for the, for the major um, operational processes that we have. Then the second point uh, is connected to less oversells. So as we have a better inventory ac accuracy, uh, we, we, we have less unhappy customers, so to say. Uh, we mm -hmm. have more accuracy. Uh, in, in our systems, uh, which, uh, which leads, uh, of course, uh, to, uh, yeah, better reliability. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the third, uh, let's say, major impact is connected uh, to the people, uh, to the people dimensioning. So we, we can offer a, a better uh, and, and more attractive uh, working uh, environment. Uh, as well, uh, to refer back to, to what Raf uh, just shared with us. So where are you in terms of your implementation and adoption of this, of this tool? How exactly is IKEA working with the Verity system today? So we have, uh, let's say one major feature, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, implemented and installed, uh, which is connected to full pellet checks. Uh, so whenever we move a pellet, a full pellet uh, within our warehouse, that's what the drones uh, do check uh, day by day. Uh, and uh, as already shared, so they, they are flying around uh, autonomously. Uh, so for us, it's really uh, to, uh, to take up uh, then the follow up and then to see, okay, uh, which discrepancies uh, did the drones found? Uh, and then it's up to us uh, to, uh, to, to replace and, and to correct. Uh, accordingly. So we have today in Switzerland five uh, IKEA stores uh, in which we have the drones flying. Well, thank you for that, Omar. It's really no surprise that one of the great innovators in the history of retailing is also a great innovator in terms of warehouse distribution and the use of drones. So a, a very interesting story. Erez uh, Agmoni of Maersk, let me bring you in and, and hear a little bit about Maersk's story and your application of Verity. What were the main problems that you were looking to solve with the Verity system? Thank you, Bob, for the question. Thank you for having me here and sharing the story. Uh, so what we found uh, in our warehouses, uh, and we, we grew very, very fast in the last few years in our warehouse footprint uh, around the world and specifically in the area I'm, I'm responsible, North America. We moved from 20 warehouses to uh, three years ago. We are now at close to 160 warehouses. So uh, when, when you grow very fast like that, uh, a lot of the old ways are inherited because you kind of forget to focus to change those things and, and we found that uh, many times when we really need a cargo we don't find it uh, it doesn't happen on a daily basis but normally 
uh, you found it that somebody made a mistake when you really, really need the cargo. So uh, the way we tackled that was in the past, sending a group of uh, three, four, five, six people, scan the warehouse very fast because there is urgency for that specific uh, missing cargo. Let's bring it, potentially find it. And you, know, you waste time, you waste energy, uh, you take people from other roles. Uh, so uh, when, when we learn about uh, the work that Raf is doing with Verity, we kind of, oh, that could be a very interesting uh, potential solution for us. And when we worked on the proof of concept, we find that definitely this could be something that uh, changed the game for us. We identified in, in the locations that we ran in the proof of concept, we identified 6% of bad uh, data. So either uh, we, we expect a, a shelf to be empty, but there is something there, or we expect the shelf to be full, but it's empty, or we expect to have these goods, but we find something else. So 6% of those cases, just think about how many hours could it lead to uh, for people to go and find it and, and actually identify all these locations. And that's kind of where we decided this is a very interesting thing for us to try to solve using the drones. So you targeted those locations where it made most sense to implement initially, right? You made that uh, correct. So the first location was just a random location we picked for a proof of concept. It was uh, uh, where we have uh, an easy buy-in from operation. You know, you need to do that in, in in a certain way to ensure that you don't get too much resistance and you show success. Uh, so we, we gave it a, a fair shot uh, and basically a team that was willing to, to do it and work on a change. And the rest was basically for Verity to prove, right? There are certain times that we do proof of concept and the vendor is so good, but the team is not cooperative. So we chose yeah. a such location. And, and after proving a success with that, uh, we decided to expand that and basically go into three locations uh, where we already installed it and fully running. It's not a proof of concept anymore. It's, it's, a, uh, it's actually running and working. Uh, where we kind of right now just finalizing the ROI calculations that we are, and the assumptions that we made originally. Because during the proof of concept, we mainly test the technology. We test that it really can work for us. And now we need to connect it back to, to the ROI. So far, it looks good. Uh, so we, we're definitely looking to expand beyond that. And how long did it take for you to set up the first site? Uh, the first site was a matter of weeks, uh, probably two months max. Uh, it was really not serious uh, amount of time. We, we were worried that it will take much longer. Uh, of course, there is a, the team needs to come on site. We need to allow it. We need to enable the team, our teams to be available. So there was a lot of uh, delays coming actually from our side. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, matter of few weeks coming, uh, the proof of concept when we ran it, it was based on a flat file information coming from a WMS. So we kind of uh, decided not to go for a full integration with WMS to ensure that we are not just dragging it months over months for testing. Uh, definitely now this is something that both uh, Verity and Maersk working on is, is to co make the connection uh, to the WMS. So uh, that's probably going to take a few months. Again, nothing really uh, that we don't see with other integration with WMS is always uh, mm -hmm. uh, difficult from our side to get the resources, but uh, really to test something like this is a matter of weeks. Yeah, and beyond that, beyond the integration you're telling about in the re relative short term, how much How much more, what are your future plans do you think uh, involve the further use of the Verity system throughout your operation? So definitely, uh, if the ROI, as we believe it is showing so far, if we believe if it will continue the right way, uh, we are looking to expand it to every locations that we have here in North America as a starting point uh, that has racking and has uh, storage. We we do have multiple type of warehouses, so uh, 
uh, for cross-dock location, it's not uh, really the, the right solution right now. But everywhere we have fulfillment with, with uh, pallets on, on racks, that's definitely something that we're looking. So there is there will be expansion beyond these three locations. Uh, something that we are working with uh, Raf and the team on is how can we actually give uh, an answer, not just for pallets, but actually for boxes. Uh, today, there is no solution that really can cover all the boxes that sits on the pallet. Uh, we do have many locations where we can grow even further, uh, where if we can give an answer for how many boxes we have actually on each spot, uh, that will give us a, a much better uh, insight. Uh, so there are a few ideas uh, that we are kind of entertaining between the teams and, and hopefully that will even make it even more successful for us. Thank you. Uh, very Thank you. soon, we are starting to introduce uh, Verity to our colleagues around the world uh, to explore other locations as well. Thank you. Well, Raf, it must be gratifying to hear these success stories of these two major customers of Verity. From your perspective, though, what do you look for when you're deciding which customers to work with? And who do you see as having the most to gain from implementing a system like yours going forward? I mean, if we're always keen on working with folks that have a great business case. That's the most important thing to us is we we really want to work with folks that get a lot of value out of our system. That's number one. Number two, with folks that are open minded and willing to try some, something that doesn't exist. Um, you know, we when we created uh, the Verity system, nothing like it existed. So it does take a bit of faith from the folks that we work with this to realize, hey, you know, we're, we're in it for, for the long run and uh, just, you know, to be able to listen to us and, and see that there's potential value there. So that's very important for us. Um, and third, I would say in terms of category, you know, uh, we really think of folks that either are 3PLs or big box retailers or manufacturers that would be, uh, uh, would result in a good business case for us. Thanks for that. Uh, at this point, I am just about ready to bring in the audience. We have a number of really, really good questions and a limited amount of time in which to ask them. But before we get to that uh, audience Q&A, let's put up a second poll question and let's find out what you folks are thinking about, about the following question. In what areas do you think inventory drones may deliver the greatest benefit to your organization? Now, this is a multiple choice. It's not one only. You can choose more than one here. So please select the ones that 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 have, that relate to you. Here they are. Here are the choices: eliminating write-offs, reducing stockouts, improving sustainability, freeing up labor hours, and reducing operational costs. So there are five choices. You can choose one or more than one. As many as those that relate to you. All of them are very compelling use cases for drone technology, as we're hearing today. It's a pretty extremely exciting area uh, with a lot of potential going forward. And we'd love to hear what you folks are thinking in terms of the big advantages there. So uh, just get a few more seconds here and uh, we'll see what the results are. Okay, here we are. Well, here we are again, boy, cost is important, isn't it? 83% said reducing operational costs. 76% said freeing up labor hours. 42% reducing stockouts, 36% eliminating write-offs, and 27% improving sustainability, which I'm guessing is going to be even more important going forward. But as of now, those are the results, all compelling use cases for drone technology. So if we could bring everybody up. If, um, if uh, I don't know if we can get... Uh, Omar back, but uh, in any case, it is time for our audience question and answer, uh, the um, question and answer portion of our presentation. And I guess basically I'm going to throw these questions out and, and see who wants to take them. Um, but this, this question is just a basic one, and it's how important is the drone itself versus the software that runs it? Maybe that's a RAF question to start? Probably, and I would say that for Erez and Omar, you could even ask an even broader question. How important is the drone? Forget about software or hardware. And I think they would say, well, they don't really care about the drone. They just care about the insights that are generated by, by the drone. But if you mm -hmm. want to drill into the drone itself, 
you know, dr a drone mechanically is a, it's a very simple device. It's four motors and propellers. The magic is all the software that runs on the drone. Now, of course you have to do a good design. Uh, and, you know, with Verity, the drone is made specifically for this purpose, just like the Kiva robots were made for the warehouse. The Verity drones are made for flying indoors to collect data and insights when you need them, where you need them. Most of the magic is in the drones, uh, is in the software that runs on the drones, uh, uh, but that's just half of it, right? Then, um, you know, you have to then take the data that is produced by the drones and extract meaningful insights from it, which is at the end of the day, all that, you know, Erez and Omar care about. I absolutely, sorry I'm jumping in, I absolutely agree with, with Raf here. It's, I, we don't care if it's a drone, if it's a, a broom flying in the air or whatever it is, you know, really what we care, it's, it's the data that he can share with us and, and the insights of this 6% that I was talking about. This is, this is tremendous. Thanks for that. Okay. Uh, this question is, are the flights autonomous? And if so, what is providing position information given that the flight is indoors where GPS is not available? What is the pre-flight planning process? Yeah, I, I probably should answer that one as well. Uh, again, because Arez and Omar just don't really care <laughs> about that kind of <laughs> stuff. But, um, you know, from a technical perspective, yeah, the, the drones do what's called uh, inside out localization, it means that all the active components are on the drone. The drone has its own sensing and illumination capabilities to be able to figure out where it is. Um, once it knows where, if you if it knows where it is, it's basically the equivalent of GPS, but it's done you know from the inside out. Uh, and then to figure out where to go, um, we we have a system that lives in the cloud. We uh, the uh, various algorithms that run to figure out which drones should perform which task. They're given missions, then they execute those missions. They don't need wireless to execute those missions. Once they know what their missions are, they take off and they execute it. They're really autonomous little entities. And then when they they land on the chargers, they do a lot of processing on the data they collected. And uh, once they're happy with what they've received, they upload that data to the cloud. And then the cloud um, uh, gets the insights out of that data, which has been processed, but there's still more insights that you want to extract from it. And then makes that available either directly to the client's WMS, once you have tighter integration as, as uh, Omar and Erez were talking about, but even when you don't, you can get started by simply having a list of potential issues that a person can read and then figure out how do I solve this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it looks like this one might be for RAP as well. We are facing a few issues with our current drones. Navigating the drone between narrow aisles seems challenging. OCR, optical character recognition, enabled drones are not very accurate. Does Verity have any solutions for this? Well, we actually deployed a system uh, with the res recently it's, uh, that has very narrow aisles. Uh, so that was a, a, a great um, um, success for us. Uh, it, um, it, it's working well, um, where, you know, you have to be careful with these narrow aisles, narrow aisles usually means one meter 60, one meter 80. Um, it is hard to fly a drone in very narrow spaces. Uh, even though you think the drone fits, there's a lot of turbulence effects that come into play here. This is where, again, we insulate our clients from that stuff by, we have very good algorithms. We have a lot of knowledge in the space. So, um, you know, we solve these problems, we can fly in VNAs now. And once you solve the problem once, well, then you can fly in any VNA site. So, Ares, this has worked for you then? It hasn't been an issue? It, it's perfectly worked for us. And I can uh, uh, repeat here what I've mentioned before. We are challenging uh, Verity with multiple new things. Uh, you know, first, our first location was regular uh, width of the eye. And then we say, you know what, if you limit us to that, I only can give you that amount of wellnesses. I need to have uh, VNAs. I need to have the very narrow aisle. So uh, uh, very fast uh, after that, uh, Verity came up with a solution. It works. It works perfectly. Uh, there are a few more challenges that, that we created, as, as uh, Raf mentioned, with uh, there is dust in the warehouse. There is uh, certain elements, but we, we managed to uh, Verity managed to come over those problems. So 
definitely uh, it works. Thank you. Uh, here's a question for Omar. Do you still do full cycle counts? And if so, how frequently? Uh, yes, uh, we do uh, because it depends where the drones uh, or where where the drones are installed and, and which location or in which areas uh, of, of the warehouse. But wherever we have the drones implemented, they're not, not anymore. So that's fully taken over by the drones. Okay, thank you. Um, this question says there can be multiple barcodes on the pallet. How does the drone select the correct one? And how does the drone know the pallet's location and address? But in addition to answering that specific question, then we have a number of questions asking about barcode requirements. So maybe I could ask Raf to provide a quick overview and then maybe address the specific point this is the questioner is, is asking. Yeah, and I, and I think actually Arez and Omar can jump into this as well because they yeah. live and breathe different uh, types of formats. But you know, we support many different types of uh, of barcodes. We can support multiple barcodes, um, and uh, you know, how do we know which one is the right one? Well, strictly speaking, you you don't right. Um, but what you do have is you have a prior from the uh, WMS that basically says this is what they think is there. So if this is what they think is there and that barcode corresponds to it, then with extremely high likelihood, that is a good match. Now, if you have multiple barcodes and none of them match with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, what the WMS thinks it is, you also have um, the rest of the WMS where one of those barcodes could be there. So you can also do the match from, hey, the WMS thinks this barcode is in this location. So you then can go and inspect that location, and figure out what's there. So you can see that there's various algorithms that you can run and checks that you can do when you have multiple barcodes in play. Some of our clients actually, um, uh, they want the multiple barcodes recorded to them. And of course we can provide that as well. Both Maersk and uh, IKEA are international operations with stores and warehouses all over the world would might create problems of standardization. I don't know. Uh, let me ask you, Arez, what's your situation with the use of barcodes vis-a-vis -vis drone technology? Is it a is it a challenge or is it just not a problem? So standardization, I don't see it happening, uh, at least not in our world, because barcodes is not belong to us. It's, it belongs to our customers. We have multiple customers each of them with their own requirements, how to use the barcodes. Sometimes we add the barcodes on, on the pallet as well, but most of the time it's not. So uh, I don't see a challenge. Um, the certain size and above that it needs to be, I think it was a 10 mil, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I forgot the exact uh, dimension, but uh, so far it was, uh, uh, it was workable uh, and, and yeah. went well. Uh, what we hope to see in the future is beyond barcode, maybe something else like RFID tags. So we can actually look into uh, the boxes level rather than just uh, the pallet level. So mm -hmm. uh, th those are discussions that we take with Verity right now. Well, Omar, IKEA is certainly known for standardization of product, uh, but at the same time, you must face issues around the world uh, with barcodes and linking that up with a system such as this. Are there are there issues? No, not at all. Uh, can fully confirm what uh, as well Raf just uh, shared before. Uh, so it's it's very much linked to the WMS system uh, that we have, and uh, we even had. Uh, or at least I'm aware about uh, a case that uh, due to the drones, uh, we figured actually out that uh, from supplier side, uh, there was, or from, let's say from, from the original uh, sender side uh, of our goods, there were some issues with the drones and due to the drones, uh, we realized that and were then able uh, to, uh, yeah, to send this information back, actually, uh, back to the supplier. So no issues at all when it comes to barcodes. Uh, like Thank you. So what is the typical accuracy of the technology? How long does it take to quote unquote train the model and increase the accuracy to acceptable levels? Let me start with the actual users on this one. Um, Rez, uh, did you, what were your experience with training the model if, if indeed such a thing was, was necessary? 
Training for fly? It, it says, training? well, training, training, at cre increasing the accuracy. This questioner is wondering about, uh, is it is it completely accurate on day one? Um, does it have to get used to the environment and your particular situation? Um, or is it ready to go? I mean, what, what, what was so, the... Uh, so, there's, so there definitely for the flying around, it takes a few days of, of uh, for Verity to... Uh, teach it uh, how to navigate with with uh, the solutions that they have. Uh, to read the barcode, it's it's a matter of uh, uh, you know it, the first day you can relatively get it uh, done. If it's done, it's done. If not, uh, uh, what needs to happen? So uh, there was no really a learning curve uh, that needs to happen. Uh, probably the only one was to train the people what to do with what you receive out of this uh, system. The system was too, so easy that I'm kind of not even think of it as a, a solution or a problem that we needed to tackle with. It's really, okay, now that we have all this information about uh, the bad uh, locations, how, how do we deal with that? What do we do? How do we make the exceptions in the, the WMS? This is a little bit of a user training from our side, but uh, the, the, nothing from the system perspective. Uh, perspective. Yeah. Erez, any um, ramp up in terms of training at IKEA? You mean Omar? I right? mean, I mean Omar. Right. I'm sorry, Omar. No, no, no. Omar. <laughs> All good. But this, the, the, uh, yeah, as I said, as I said before, exactly the same uh, at IKEA. System works quite fast, and then it's really about the ways of working. How do we train people? How do they know uh, how to work? actually with the outcome that we get uh, from the drones and how to make sure that uh, we take these insights with our people to train them properly and that we really make sure that the same mistakes uh, do not happen again uh, and again. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a key, uh, at least for me, uh, then uh, for sustained success, working mm -hmm. with drones. Yeah. Maybe I'll just add to that. Um, you know, uh, we know we're doing our job properly when we insulate our clients from even thinking about those things, right? It's, they don't care. They don't care how we do it. They just care that it does it. Um, so, um, you know, how do we do it? Well, that's obviously a lot of our secret sauce and our IP is around being able to just make a system that works um, uh, all the time. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just happy that we have folks uh, that are willing to try try this to see that actually this thing does work the very first time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this questioner is asking about safety concerns, obviously an important thing uh, in warehouses. What are the safety concerns and how do we address it? Maybe we'll start with you, Raf, talk about how you built that into the model and what are your experiences in ensuring the safety of the humans who are working side by side or beneath these drones? So there's various safety things that you can do. Um, the, the first and easiest thing to do, of course, is to make sure that the drones and people are nowhere near each other, right? That's the, that's <laughs> the easiest thing to do. And that's actually what we currently do with our clients is that they operate the system when, they're, when they know that there's no one going to be there. As I mentioned earlier, you know, our system can operate in complete darkness. Uh, so um, that's obviously you don't want people to be there when it's completely dark. So that's number one. Having said that, of course, um, you never know when there's going to be folks nearby. So we have, you know, we use the various sensors that are on the drone to determine if there are people, uh, objects in the way. And when there are, we take actions to avoid them. Uh, so there's various safety factors that go into it. The other one is just simply um, having these drones designed for the purpose at hand and having all of the years of experience doing that, we have a data set of over 400,000 fully autonomous flights. This has made, you know, we do pre-flight checks before we take off. Uh, we constantly monitor the system. So the best way to, you know, like an, when you take off in an airplane, you do all the pre-flight checks. And if something is, you don't think is gonna be right, you don't fly the plane. We do the same thing with our drones and that doesn't even happen that often. So there's various safety features that go on and we've never had a safety incident. Okay, thank you for that. What about cybersecurity? Any issues there? The security of the system, the uh, problems of hacking, anything of that kind? Are, are you protected well against that, Raph? I mean, absolutely. We, um, we 
use best practices for making sure that things are encrypted, uh, communications are encrypted. Um, we have a cloud-based solution that we are rolling out. And obviously we take best practices to do that. Um, you know, if banking can do it, then we can do it as well. So there's a lot of best practices that can adopt. Um, we, uh, we do pen testing with our development to make sure that there are no vulnerabilities in our processes. Um, so, you know, there's, there are best practices and we use them. Um, of course, we try to insulate our clients from that, that as much as possible. But frankly, their IT groups are very much into this. They're mm -hmm. the, IT, the IT groups of, you know, certainly Maersk and IKEA and, and most folks, I would assume, are very much on top of this. And they're going to really scrutinize your solution to make sure that you meet their requirements. Otherwise, they won't let you into their warehouse. We do have time, unfortunately, for just one more question. And I'm going to pose it to, well, maybe Ralph to start with. Here's the question. It seemed like it didn't take long for Kiva Systems to create massive change in how warehouses operate, not just at Amazon, but at warehouses everywhere. Do you see inventory drones having the same level of impact across the industry? I mean, I think so. And it's usually takes time for things to go into this exponential curve. You have the early adopters, um, that kind of go out on a limb and take the risk and see, you know, see that this is viable. And then when other folks see the value that is being provided, then they jump in. And it's also co-evolution of the of the system itself. As we work with, you know, with Maersk and IKEA, we learn more and more about their use cases. We try to address more of their pain points, which makes the system even more valuable. So I think all of these things are kind of autocatalytic, right? They feed on themselves. And before you know it, this becomes something that you can't imagine being without. Thank you, Ralph. You know, I just cannot overemphasize how exciting it was today to have representatives of two of the most innovative companies within their particular sectors, Maersk and Ikea, as well as the co-founder of Kiva Systems, one of the great technology disruptors of our time, Ralph DeAndrea of Verity. So Omar Esbiri, also of Ikea, and Erez Agmoni of Maersk, thanks all of you for this great presentation today. So once again, I want to thank our great speakers. I want to thank our audience for your participation, for your fantastic questions. Everybody have a great day.